Hey, folks, Zach Osmond here. I'm Insider Indianapolis Star. It is Wednesday, October 23rd, 2024. This is Mind Your Banners for October 23rd, 2024. He is Mike Nislik. I'm Zach Osterman. Um, we are, Mike, in the throes now of a historic week in, in IU football history. Game day uh, is, well, I imagine somebody from game day is in town. I mean, it sounded like Big Noon Kickoff basically just packed everything up and drove to the next site. Um, no days off. So I would imagine somebody from game days in town. And uh, obviously the whole crew is going to be in town by the end of the week because Indiana is hosting Washington. Indiana is undefeated. Indiana is top 15 and Indiana is seven and zero because of, and we'll start here an absolute, uh, I don't know, demolition, I guess of Nebraska last Saturday, 56 to seven, the Hoosiers never trailed yet again. Uh, the game was never even tied once Indiana scored its first touchdown. Um, we will talk about, obviously, Curtis Brooks' injury and Taven Jackson sort of stepping up into that starting role for at least one week. We'll talk about how all that affects the Washington game. But first, Mike, I guess you've had a few days to digest it. What are your sort of final parting thoughts on Nebraska? Yeah, I mean, just like you said, um, you know, probably one of the biggest. I mean, was that the most – I mean, it had to been the most – I mean, you saw the couple of the Rutgers games they they dominated, but, I mean, this was the best team that they've beat by that. I mean, most handle it, you know, like victory you've seen them have over your tenure. Yeah, I mean, I think your point was valid, which was this wasn't a Nebraska team that was bad. Like, this wasn't – and we'll see how good they, they wind up being, but, like, this wasn't a Nebraska team that was, you know, somehow, um, you know, like flawed or beat up. Like this was supposed to be a, you know, all things considered a, a, a pretty good team. Um, and, you know, it. sometimes you see games, and I understand 56 is a hard number to score by accident, but sometimes you do see games and, you know, things just kind of get away from a team for a little while or something kind of fluky happens or, or, you know, a couple touchdowns get scored under weird circumstances. Like, that wasn't this. Like, Indiana just – I don't know if you watched any of the highlights back because um, I didn't tape the game, so I had to watch the highlights packages. And by the end of the game, Gus Johnson and, and Joel Clatt are just kind of beside themselves. You know, like, they're, they're, they're like yeah, – I mean, they're just like touchdown Indiana. Geez, <laughs> like you know, it's just like like it. You know, they they're no longer marveling at it. They're you know they're they're sort of like it's all become kind of indecent. The fact that they're everyone's still watching this, um, and that's against a team that was supposed to be a real test for Indiana. And and frankly, you know, more than just um, you know the 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 big picture stuff. Like for example, you brought up that Indiana's, I know we talked about kind of the unsung heroes and things in a podcast recently. You you pointed out Indiana's run game had kind of regressed a little bit in conference play. I mean, this was a, you know, a statement performance from that ground game, even irrespective. Yeah, it, 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 rebounded, it rebounded nicely. Yeah. And you sort of see some of those performances, again, against a team that was supposed to push or test Indiana. And it, it really does kind of reframe a lot of what it feels like we're supposed to think about this team. And I, and I think it would be remiss. I, mean, I think a lot of it, the focus has been on the uh, offense. Um, wrote about the defense today. Uh, they made the tweak in the secondary. Um, uh, and Terry Jones uh, entered the uh, starting lineup. Um, Amari Farrell shifted over to strong safety in place of Josh uh, Sanguinetti. Uh, Sean Asbury remained where he was. Um, and um, two stats that I looked up. They only allowed 4.05 yards per play. That's the fewest since the uh, 2021 loss to Michigan State. And those five turnovers they forced were the most since uh, 2009 uh, when they forced six six against Iowa. Um, So, I mean, the defense wasn't just good. It was great. Um, And, again, Nebraska's run game wasn't – very good, but um, it had been a competent offense, you know, throughout the season. Obviously, forced to go a little um, one-dimensional once the game got away, but um, 
man was the uh, yeah. defense effective. And, and it sounds like that, obviously, that change is going to stay. Uh, uh, the quote was um, Kurt Signetti on Monday. We like that way. We like the way that played out of, of the changes. So yeah. Yeah. people put together these, these graphs of um, net success rate, which people who don't know, like it's, it's a little bit more complex than this, but since success rate is basically just an attempt to measure like down to down, how successful the plays you are running are versus how successful the plays that your opponent are running are. And they put together these these like net success rates and it's like a bar graph and there's like a negative side and a positive side for basically like just how lopsided a game was. Did you see that one for this week? Uh, I think, I think it was. <laughs> like, like it was, it was like a very sort of natural progression up and then it got to Indiana and Nebraska and it just, it just, went, whoop. Yeah. <laughs> it just, I mean, it was it, it, like, it was just, there was no area of this game where Indiana did not outplay Nebraska. I mean, even in special teams, Indiana wasn't fielding kickoffs at the one yard line and running out of bounds. Like, um, there was just that no was a great there. play. That was a that was a that was. The <laughs> I had no idea. But I I assume he sort of like, I assume his intention was to call for a fair catch, and then he just kind of like panicked. But yeah, I, I've never seen a player catch a a punt. Maybe like a punt, you kind of lose where you are on the field. Like a kickoff, you got a long time to go looking for that thing. And anyway, no, I mean, there just there was not an area of this game where Indiana did not, I mean, not just outperform Nebraska, but pretty substantially outperform Nebraska. I mean, um, you know. Yeah, and I told you I listened to uh, Matt Rule's press conferences. Um, I went back and watched the one after the game, and that one was interesting in terms of him just being like basically – it was almost like the Nate Bargatze sketch from last year from the SNL where he's on the chef show and he just keeps apologizing. And that was basically what Matt Rule did for 10 minutes. He's like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to the fans that had to come – that spent money to watch this. I'm sorry. I didn't see it coming. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was just basically like, um, yeah, not great. And then, you know, Monday – Sort of just said, you know, it was Indiana uh, is, a, is a pretty good team. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, yeah, he said they were a top ten team last week. I, I wonder if he <laughs> did he a top ten team or a top jumped. one team. <laughs> jumped. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't. I mean, like, I, I don't know. I've like a, a couple times Sunday. I was looking back through things and even just from a neutral perspective, like I just saw this the final score again and just like laughed because I just I, I'm not you are I mean listen I've covered a lot of Indiana teams that lost games like that you know maybe not quite by that score but in that way um well we should mention it's the most lopsided win they've had in program history of a big ten opponent tied for and the other one was in 1945 so um that, that was that team went undefeated and won the big ten so I mean you know it's been a minute uh Mutt Deal. Mutt Deal was captain. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Like, it's just and, – and what I will say, and I think this is – I do think this is relevant, and the reason why I think it's relevant is because ultimately, at this point, Indiana has played itself into the playoff conversation, and it may well play itself out of the playoff conversation at some point. But right here, right now, Indiana has absolutely played its way into conversations about – you know, who who should be picked for the 12-team playoff. Um, this game really has changed the national perception, I think, of Indiana. Like, there was a real sense nationally that before this game that Indiana was an interesting story, that Kurt Signetti was doing a really good job, but that they hadn't really played anybody yet. And... And oddly enough, like I actually haven't seen, and I've had some IU fans say they've seen, I have not seen a ton of sort of the narrative reframing as, oh, actually, it turns out Nebraska is terrible. I have seen this reframed as Indiana finally played somebody and holy crap, look what Indiana did. Um, and not necessarily anybody anointing Indiana. Like, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not... Um, I'm not suggesting that, you know, that, that Indiana is somehow like, um, 
that Indiana is somehow just turning, you know, turning heads all over the place. But I mean, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at um, the the um, the AP poll here. The, the, there's a website called CollegePollTracker.com that will track kind of week to week where your team lands. And if you go back to week eight, two voters had Indiana in the top 10. One, Stephen Means had him seventh, and Greg Maddy had him 10th. Um, you had a small handful of voters beyond that who had them in the top 15. Most people were clustering them somewhere 16 to 20, 16 to 22. This week, you've gone from two voters with Indiana in the top 10 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. That is a big jump. That is a big jump for the fact that you beat a good team, but you didn't beat Ohio State. You didn't beat Oregon. You didn't, you know, you didn't go on the road to Penn State or Michigan and win. You won a home game against a team that was not ranked in the AP poll, it was ranked in the coaches poll. Um, but was not ranked in the AP poll when the game kicked off. Um, you know, to go from to 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 multiply the number of AP voters that think Indiana is a top ten team by a factor of nine in one week um, tells you that national perception is changing around Indiana. And listen, number one, the AP voters don't decide who goes in the playoff. Obviously, number two. Indiana can lose its next game. You're, you're only ever as good as your next game when you're trying to climb as high as, as reaching the playoff. So Indiana can lose its next, next game and then all of this goes away. But I do think what was important, at least to some extent around this, this win was, I think it really did. I think it really did um, wake some people up to the idea that, that this is, this is just a, a very good football team. It's a football team that's balanced. It's a football team that plays well in all three phases. And it's a football team that like, if you've got weaknesses, it will find them. If you're not prepared, it will find you out for it. Um, and apparently it can be rather ruthless when the opportunity presents itself. Well, yeah, I think some of the reaction to the game has been muted just because, and we can kind of pivot here to the sort of the injury of it all. I mean, you know, losing your starting quarterback, um, at least for, for one game here, um, you know, sets up sort of – it makes that Washington game even more interesting. Obviously, Taven Jackson uh, will get the start. Um, Kurt Signetti said, you know, they have, they have confidence in him. The team has confidence in him. Omar Cooper talked uh, a little bit about kind of that the, the locker room was impressed at the way Taven came in in that second half, um, you know, kind of out of the cold and, and – um, Kept you know, three straight three three straight scoring drives, four to five possessions that he had. Uh, they scored. They extended that lead. Um, he was near perfect. Completed his first six passes. Um, and, and Omar's point was that he's seen him kind of come through the other side. You know, last year losing the job, which we talked a little bit about earlier this week, and also. You know, there's been some different perceptions. Um, you know, we've heard from the coaching staff. You know, they kept the competition open throughout the off season. And, you know, um, Curtis Rourke told him that, you know, told Curtis Rourke that the job wasn't his, wasn't his, you know, guaranteed, but that Taven and other teammates kind of looked at it like he was the second string guy because he only played with really the second string in the spring. And so he had to sort of mentally get used to just like, I'm going to be the backup. And so uh, he sort of came through out on the other side of that. Um, and now, you know, um, played well in the half he played against Nebraska and has a chance to sort of, um, you know, spotlight some of the growth he's made as, as a quarterback, um, you know, because, you know, I, well, I felt that the coaching staff last year kind of shortchanged him. He was uneven. I just thought he needed to play through it, and he didn't get a chance. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, I think there was at least a sense that, that he wasn't handled very well. And that the, the position wasn't handled very well, let's be fair. But the, the, the biggest casualty of that was probably Taven Jackson. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, like, look, you don't give a guy a job, give him, give him two weeks, and then take it away after having a competition that didn't just last last the spring, last of the spring, fall, and into the season, and then to give him two, <laughs> to give him two games to start. I mean, you laugh at it. I mean, it's ridiculous, right? And, and we were sitting here a year ago, or roughly a year ago, trying to like sort of be like, well, you know, I guess it could make sense because you have to figure out 
like your job is to kind of is to, to to put yourself in the shoes of the people making the decisions and try to figure out how they justify it just so you can understand it and understand like how it might succeed or how it might fail. But I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, well, the only way it made sense was like, look, we landed on tape and we give him the season to sort of make it his team. Um, right. And we don't have to relitigate that. I mean, they got scared because the, the, obviously everybody's job was on the line. Um, but it, it, the, the, like you said, the the guy that lost, I mean, Tom Allen lost, I guess. He got fired. But Taven Jackson also lost. Yeah, but Taven <laughs> Jackson didn't get $15.5 million for the trouble. So Right. So I guess I guess there's degrees, right? Um, Unless he's got just an insane NIL deal. Yeah, that it's all knows. going to him. Um, but no, I mean, and you give a guy credit um, to, to sort of, be able to sort of like you know it, it, that's a, it was a tough deal for him I, I feel like it was well and I think it was also hard for him because you know unlike Brendan Sorsby and, and listen Sorsby's having a great season at Cincinnati and Taven has looked good when we've seen him in, in pockets going back even to the spring game so I think there's there's a decent chance that that both players wind up having perfectly fine college careers um but unlike Sorsby Taven also had to wear a lot of pressure. Like he was the four-star kid. It was a huge deal when he visited from, from Tennessee and he was Trace's little brother. And, you know, the fan base knew him really well because they watched him play football and basketball at center Grove. And it like, and I'm not, I'm not even necessarily criticizing Tom Allen for this. You know, when, when a coach is, when a coach is losing and trying to turn it around, they've, they've got to frame things a certain way and they've got to sell things a certain way. But that did mean that whether anybody said it out loud or not, Taven Jackson kind of got pushed into the role of like, he's coming here to help save this program. He's coming here to help like pull this back up. And it's, it's sort of like, you know, Hey, he's got a ton of arm talent. He's a redshirt freshman who hasn't played very much football at the college level. That's a lot to put on him, especially when he's also, a two-time state champion from Center Grove, whose brother's like the third all-time leading scorer in IU basketball history, and he's transferring in from Tennessee. And you know, I think there there were various points in the offseason at which it it felt like certain people within the program were trying very hard to push Taven out to the front. And I think there were times last season you talked about what Omar Cooper said, and, and I did go back and watch some of that video. Um, but, you, you know, it, it, there were times last season where it felt like Taven was trying really hard to be a junior in a freshman's shoes. And that's admirable, but it's also difficult. And, you know, I actually think that, like, if, if Taven Jackson – there is an argument, at least in my mind, for the idea that if Taven Jackson does go on to have a successful Indiana career, however many years he starts, however, you know, however many years he, he, he plays a prominent role – that actually Indiana going and getting Curtis Rourke and letting Jackson like take a year to breathe behind a more experienced player develop and, and really just kind of continue to progress his game may wind up being better for him long-term and it may wind up being better for him on Saturday. He was seven of eight. Uh, do you like that segue? That was smooth. He was seven of eight against Nebraska, 91 yards, uh, two touchdowns, had two more rushes for 21 yards. Kind of a reminder. I think that, He's probably a little more mobile than Curtis Rourke. I don't know if Indiana is going to want to tap into that side of his game too much because if Jackson gets hurt, then you're down to two true freshmen. Um, <clears throat> but it is there. At least it, it is an option. I went back and found <clears throat> five of his – and, again, I should have just taped the game. But I went back and found five of his eight throws against Nebraska. And I'm pretty confident in saying at least four of them were one-read throws. So th there's – you know. Th you can kind of go both ways on this. Like on the one hand, you know, you look at Taven Jackson and in the spring game, Kurt Signetti points out he had a really nice spring game, but he was going against the second team defense. Rourke was going against the first team defense. He His didn't just was, point it out. He said, what was the quote? It was, was our, was he that, were they that good? Or was our second team defense that bad? And I yeah, think yeah. I know the answer. So yeah. let's, let's, let's oh, be clear. Okay. What is, okay, but what if Kurt Signetti was wrong with this? Because here we are, Indiana seven and zero. I'm just saying he had his thumb on the yeah. scale of what he thought that answer was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he looked good against Nebraska. Was Indiana giving him easier throws because they're worried he can't do the more advanced stuff, or was Indiana giving him easier throws because 
you're insert, inserting a backup quarterback into a game midstream. And I know everyone will say, I prepare like a starter. Every, every player at every position will say, I'm, you're always preparing like a starter. A backup quarterback can't prepare like a starter. They, they don't get the reps in practice. They don't get, you know, the, the, the scheme adjustments that are geared toward them. And so there is an extent to which you basically just have 10 minutes in the locker room to get Taven Jackson, you know, warmed up mentally before you need to get him on the field to warm up physically to play in this game. And I think there's every chance that Indiana was giving him some, you know, some quicker throws just to try and get him comfortable and just to try and not. Well, to your point, um, go ahead. To your point that uh, when you, uh, according to Pro Football Focus, all of his attempts were, you know, zero to 10 yards. Like he only had one attempt over 20. That um, was the pass, I think. Yeah, which is that throw. I mean, it was a gorgeous throw. Again, yeah. you want to talk about the noises Joel Clapp made when he watched that play. He just <laughs> like he, he made it, he made a, 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 a very discernible noise. But yeah. But you could see everything was around the line of scrimmage. So, I mean, to, to your point. No, I mean, it, it just, like I said, is it, are you giving him the quicker throws, the easier throws, the one read throws? And by the way, let's also say, too, Curtis Rourke gets plenty of one read throws. That's part of what makes this offense good is it sets up a lot of snap drop pass. Like it, 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 it gets the ball out very quickly. Well, a lot of them. Some, like we've talked about the slants that they run that would have been very good to help t- build Taven's confidence last year that they just never did. So, I mean, those are throws that he should be able to execute. Well, and the part. perimeter screen game too, which those throws are harder than I think people give, yeah. give them credit for. Like you've got to put them in the right place because you can't, you can't turn your player around. And if you throw it too far ahead of him, it's going to be an incompletion or even worse. Um, you know, and, but, but those are like, those are timing throws, they're rhythm throws. So it's as likely you're giving him the throws you, that Indiana gave him on Saturday in the second half, just trying to get his timing down and trying to just kind of put him in a position where it's like, Hey, when we have a full week with you, a lot of this stuff will be more advanced, but right here today, let's, let's not make any mistakes. Let's not destroy a, a, a young guy's confidence. Let's just keep things ticking over. And the other thing I would say in, and I said this to somebody yesterday, um, sort of to the counter, because I know you, you you went back and checked my receipts on on backup quarterbacks. Um, thank you so much for that. Well, uh, I, and, and people are like, "Whoa, fire!" But I, I did think it was illustrated. <laughs> Whoa, fire! That was that was actually another one of Gus Johnson's touchdown goals. Whoa, fire! I did think it was it illustrative. Clear, Gus, if you're listening, it was just a joke. I do think it was illustrative to see where people where they are at. And Indiana was in a bind because they had so much to get out of the transfer portal that they couldn't get. It would have been impossible to get two quarterbacks with experience. Um, but he's, he's about in the middle. So, I mean, you know, uh, Michigan State's on this one extreme end. They've got a North Dakota State uh, starter who had like five years of experience. A couple teams took uh, have true freshmen uh, as their backups. Um, you know, Taven uh, isn't in the worst spot. And, and some teams I think would be envious of having a guy like him. Um, but you know, I think teams that had a, didn't have to get 40 players out of the transfer portal did try to seek out at least, you know, have a a quarterback situation with two guys or or some experience. Yeah. Um, but the other thing I, 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 what I said to somebody yesterday was I I understand, um, anybody who sort of looks at David Jackson and says, you know, he's, he's younger, he's obviously got less time on task. You know, you're going to have to tweak the offense in some ways. And that's obviously true of anybody. You know, no two quarterbacks are exactly the same. But the flip side to that is, again, if we if we are talking about narrative, and I don't want to get dragged too deep into this stuff because you can kind of go down the rabbit hole of, you know, rat poison and Kirby Smart disrespect and nobody believes in us and whatever. But... If, the, if this was Ohio State and, and Indiana, you know, if Indiana had been Ohio State on Saturday afternoon and they've been up 28 to 7 at halftime, they've lost their starting quarterback, their backup, who was a redshirt sophomore, four, former four star, elite 11 participant, two time, I think he won two state championships. I'm almost certain he did. Two time state champion at a powerhouse program in his own state, stepped in and went seven of eight for 91 yards and two touchdowns. We, and and then the next week, Ohio State was hosting as a favorite at home. You know, a, a team that it is is that where the there are more obvious advantages than just the quarterback position. We wouldn't be sitting here saying, "Boy, how's Ohio State going to manage?" You know, 
being without so-and-so, we'd be saying, well, it's Ohio State. There's always someone really talented waiting in the wings. This is just the next cab off the rank. You know, this is – of course their backup is 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 going to step in and be just as good. Um, I think there are ways that Indiana is going to have to make life easier for Taven Jackson on Saturday. But I just I, – I just – I do feel like – there's an extent to which, especially when you also consider this staff's track record of m- molding an offense around a quarterback, going back to its time at James Madison, I do feel like there are still reasons to believe Indiana can make this work pretty well. And that ties into a point that uh, I tweeted this the quote out uh, that Jed Fish was talking about, uh, Washington's head coach. Um, uh, he was talking about kind of Indiana's body of work um, so the quarterback kind of thing where, you know, he looks at it like teams have not put them in a bad spot and the play callers haven't been pressured, you know, playing with the lead, he said, allows you to sort of not have that play caller pressure to sort of, what do I do here? Do I got to call a pass? Cause we got to get erase these points off the boards and things like that. Cause I've never trailed this season. And that'll be, I think an interesting, interesting dynamic Saturday is if Washington can come out to a lead and actually put some pressure on an Indiana team that, has not faced a moment where they faced a deficit with a backup quarterback that look, it's going to, it could get in your head a little bit where you're like, I got to try to make a play here. And that's the moment where things get dicey because they're going to try to tell him like, you don't, that's the the last, last thing you need to do is force a throw. Um, But if Washington gets a lead, does that creep in? Um, And I was thinking too, Nebraska was asked about this. A rule was asked about if he thought about taking the ball. Because Indiana started with the ball, I think uh, seven or six of the seven games they played, um, and you know just sort of obviously dominated in the first quarter. If I'm Washington, you know if I win that toss, I'm probably taking the ball. Like I, yeah, I don't know, I, I would take the ball um, yeah. and, and try to get get points on the board. I know everybody talks about the middle eight and you know the the benefits of having the possibility of closing out the score and, and getting a score in the third quarter, but at this point. <laughs> We, the, an opposing team wants to just get an, anything on the board to try to derail Indiana's sort of constant rhythm on offense that they've been in for seven straight weeks. I also think the, the other reason, and, and obviously this is going to be a talking point around how Indiana kind of protects, not protects, but helps Taven Jackson. Washington, uh, Washington started the season very well on defense. They have regressed badly, particularly against the run um, over their first Four games, they only gave up 150 plus rushing yards once. They only gave up two touchdowns in the ground on the ground through their first four games. In their last three games, they're giving up an average of 192.7 rushing touchdowns, and they've allowed five. The only game they won in that stretch was Michigan. They still allowed Michigan to rush for 4.7 yards per carry and 174 overall. The problem Michigan had, obviously, is that Michigan just could not pass the ball, cannot pass the ball. Quarterback plays, I mean, like you talk about teams that would love to have a backup like Taven Jackson. I'm not sure Michigan wouldn't love to try Taven Jackson as it well, started. Well, Michigan was an exception on that list. I couldn't even list a backup because they're all sort of – they don't have a starter right now. Yeah, so. yeah, they, yeah there, there is no there is no QB1, um, really. The point is Washington has regressed pretty badly um, against the run, and that obviously comes at a bad time if you're Washington because you were fair in pointing out Indiana's – rushing offense has had not been quite as good against some conference opponents. It was, you know, it was, it was sort of lesser against uh, UCLA. It wasn't really very good at all in, in terms of yards Now touchdowns, Indiana scored at least two touchdowns on the ground in every single game it's played this year. But in terms of yards, in terms of things like success rate, the rushing offense had regressed a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> this is a bad time. If you're Washington to be playing Indiana, um, Saturday was, by virtually any measure, the best rushing performance adjusted for competition Indiana's put together all season. Yes, they were better against Western Illinois, but I think, again, let's adjust for who they were playing. 33 carries, 215 yards, 6.5 yards per carry, five touchdowns against a team that had not allowed a rushing touchdown all season. Indiana's only the second team, I said this on Saturday, only the second team to rush for 200-plus as a group against a Tony White defense. Tony White is a Nebraska defensive coordinator. He got there at the beginning of last – he started at the beginning of last season. 
The only other team that did it was Michigan, who obviously ran the ball so well, won a national championship last year. I'm not suggesting this is a sign Indiana is going to win a national title, but it is to me a suggestion that the offensive line, some things probably got cleaned up, maybe improved upon during the bye week, and that run game looks about as formidable as it has all year. At a time when, if you're Washington, you, again, you talk about taking the ball, I wouldn't necessarily want to give Indiana the ball and let them just kind of start pounding away at me with their ground game, burn some clock, almost kind of get in control of the game and control of how tired my defense is right away, because that could be a long day. That could be a recipe for a very long day for Washington, um, even if Indiana opens some things up in the past with Taven Jackson. Yeah, and, I, you know, one thing, too, I mean – this is the they make the change in the secondary. Indiana does, um, you know, I think that probably was made in mind with you know going against a group of quarterbacks. Michigan's the glaring exception. Um, that's better than the first six that you faced. Um, you know, when you look at Washington's past numbers, they're completing seventy-two percent of their attempts on the season, averaging eight point four yards attempt, um, only two interceptions. Um, Will Rogers obviously has just a, you know a ton of experience, um, and so how does that sort of um, uh, like I said I, a couple weeks ago I you know that's why I labeled Washington as kind of you know what I thought might be the trickiest game to get past because they have a quarterback that can do the things that Curtis Rourke did make the right decisions uh, you know make the reads downfield to sort of um, you know burn your defense and. Um, Indiana obviously locked everything down against Nebraska um, against a freshman who I think got really rattled. Um, and so I think kind of two keys will be to, if they get similar pressure, that won't be as much of a problem, which they've done basically all season. Um, um, and if the secondary holds up, forces those turnovers, again, not going to be a problem. But I just think Will Rogers uh, will probably be have a little steady head on his shoulders, especially if things don't go their way right away. Um, that's sort of kind of the one thing that I'd like to interested in seeing just because we have, I don't, I don't know. I feel like we haven't had a quarterback uh, come in here from the opposition that, that that's had that sort of resume and sort of experience. I mean, he's, he's, there's a pretty strong argument. He's the best quarterback Indiana's faced or will have faced this season. If you want to look at like the numbers, you know, he's, he's fifth in the conference and quarterback rating, according to CFB stats, the, the only four players ahead of him are Curtis Rourke and, and three quarterbacks Indiana either hasn't seen yet and Will Howard or won't see at all in the regular season and Drew Aller and Dylan Gabriel. Um, you know, he's, again, if you're talking about things like yards per attempt, he's top five in that. He has the, the fourth best completion rate in, in the conference. So, you know, he's not somebody like it, it. He's basically, I mean, I would, I don't know if this is a, a perfect comparison but i think you're probably talking about a player that's a quarterback that is is a better version of billy edwards in in a lot of ways now obviously indiana was able to beat maryland um you do wonder if that the complexion of that game plays out differently if ty felton's healthy for all of it um i also think it's it's worth pointing out you know you you brought up uh, when we talked about washington a couple of weeks ago um, the, the the receivers they have, Indiana, I think it is probably fair to say, really struggled with Caden Prather's size. Um, in that Maryland game, Washington's got guys that have some size. Denzel Boston uh, is is a really big. I think he's like six foot three, six foot four. Giles Jackson is is smaller. Um, but the point is, they've got two wide receivers that are are effective, very productive. You know, two guys with 540 plus, um, and one of them a, a real physical mismatch against pretty much anyone they anyway plays. Um, so I think this is I think your your point about the not just the sort of like on paper matchups or the tech the tactical sort of chess match if you want to say, but I think that the the flow and the rhythm of the game can Washington get to a place where it's disrupting Indiana at all offensively. Um, not necessarily just with what it's doing defensively, but with maybe making Indiana feel a little bit uncomfortable on the scoreboard with a backup quarterback, a younger quarterback in there. Um, I mean, I, I, that is 
kind of a fascinating layer to this. Now, to be fair, I think that's just going to be a layer to basically every game Indiana plays from here on out. They've been so dominant that you just sort of um, – Well, but one of the points is that Work avoided some of that and the coaching staff pointed that out, that he's been in every situation. They just – the first time they've been, it, it matters, I feel like. And then now to do it, if they faced a deficit, you know, he's always talked about like a two-touchdown deficit in the first half. To do that with a backup quarterback just amplifies it. Like if they that happened at Michigan State with Curtis Rourke as a starter, I think it would be less of a concern. Um, you know, they, they get the benefit of being at home this weekend, but less of a concern with Rourke in given his experience versus Jackson. Um, that's, I think, the difference. No, I, I, I get that. I just mean also like more generally in terms of like the raw numbers of it all, like Max Olson from ESPN had a, a, a really interesting stat on Sunday. Indiana Indiana scoring margin through seven games is they're plus 245. They've scored 200, 245 more points than their opponents. Um, since 2020, that's the best number any, any team has posted through seven games. That's better than 22 Ohio State, 23 Michigan, 22 Georgia, and 21 Georgia. Three of those four teams obviously won national titles. The fourth, if I'm not mistaken, went to the playoff. I think that was the Ohio state team that almost beat Georgia in the playoffs. So the point I'm trying to make is there is an extent to which I think every opponent has, you know, team coaches always talk about, we we're more worried about us. We're more focused on what we do. And that's, there's always an extent to which that's a lie <laughs> that, that you are going to be focused. Wow. on. What you, do. You, you have to be able, you have to be able to focus that's on that. Fire. But uh, at all coaches in all sports everywhere, including myself, uh, go by side cycling, and um, I do think like facing a team that is is has been to this point, and we'll see if it changes as the competition ramps up. Has been to this point so dominant on both sides of the football. There kind of is an extent to which, if you, as much as you can, you need to layer into your game plan. Like it's not just if we score or how many we score; it's when we score. It's how we score. I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure it was by accident, or at least maybe this is the way to better way. I bet right up until the interception, Matt Rule would have would have been happy with the fact that that first drive Nebraska got in the second half took more than seven minutes. And the idea that, like, if, if they punched it in there, and this is why I think Kurt Signetti actually went out of his way to highlight that interception as being kind of the, the, the crucial moment in the game in his mind. Because if Nebraska punches it in there, suddenly you got a tired defense. You know, you're up a couple scores, but you got a, a you got a younger quarterback taking his first snaps, meaningful snaps in a Big Ten game so far this season. If Indiana gives it right back and Nebraska scores again, everything starts tilting back in the other direction. And that's where I think game state is is going to be a big part of how opponents approach Indiana until somebody until Indiana reaches somebody that just thinks they can stop Indiana on their merits and their talents, I think you have to layer that in. And, you know, that's that's where I think Washington, you know, maybe really, to your point, hammers home the idea of let's get on the scoreboard early and let's see if we can't apply any kind of scoreboard pressure to this team in all phases. Yeah, and, and one more point um, just about Rodgers, which I find interesting, is that um, he's 12 of 23 on throws, deep throws, 20 yards or more, six touchdowns, no receptions. He's, uh, according to Pro Football Focus, they gave him a 96.3 grade in on those throws. That's the third highest in the country. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, not many teams have gone gone deep against uh, any other. They haven't allowed very many explosive plays. And so if they can bust one of those early um you know, the kind of the inverse of Maryland, where Maryland had success late, sort of with some of the deep passing throws that they had um, when the game was sort of meaningless. Um, I don't know. I, I'm just, like I said, we'll see how that kind of all unfolds. Yeah, but if you're Washington, you're probably hoping you can get the ball first and sort of do anything to just derail what has become a monster on offense. I'm also like, and I guess this is, I, I don't know how this affects the matchup, but I'm also just kind of fascinated by these two programs. Like I remember us talking about Washington in the preseason and, and you know, 
Jed Fish getting up there at media days and, you know, filibustering for a long time and talking about just how much it turned over in his program. And, and I, I know I was skeptical, but then I also said, you know, but probably a lot of people in that room would have said the same thing about Indiana. Um, when Kurt Sigetti gets up there and talks about all the roster turnover he had to deal with. It is interesting the extent to which, like, you have two coaches here that, like, to a great, you know, to, to a, a noticeable extent, just kind of tried to pick up their program at their previous stop and then just move it and, and lay it down in their new program. You know, Fish brought a, a few Arizona transfers with him. I think he brought a couple, you know, a little bit of staff with him. Obviously, we've talked many times about Kurt Signetti um, and, and all the sort of JMU influence on this roster. I just think it's it's fascinating kind of watching these two programs, and, and Washington has some maybe disadvantages that Indiana doesn't have in its first year in, in the Big Ten. To, to kind of try to do the same thing, you know, and, and, and went and, you know, going out and hiring somebody who's a program builder that essentially their first step in building the program is is almost just to kind of try and overlay the old program in a very physical way on the new one. Um, obviously, it's going better for Indiana, but Washington's still four and three. Um, I'm looking at I'm trying to look at their schedule right now. Um, they have a, a rougher one the other side of this. They they go to Indiana, then they host USC, then they go to Penn State, then they host Washington, then they finish at Oregon. So, I mean, that, that that's a team that's probably going to be happy to get to bowl eligibility this season. Um but I don't know. I just like it. It's a it's a fascinating comparison to me of, of two programs that seem to be kind of trying to do some of the same things, obviously from different starting points, but some of the same things. Yeah, I think he only I think I, I don't know if that starter's still in place, but I think the, I, I thought it was only one returning starter from I think he said one. Yeah, yeah the team last year, uh, obviously, you know, crazy amount of turnover um, and the identity of the offense with with. Um, you know what they did last year, but yeah, I mean, he, he had to do the same thing and his, the timing of his start was, was much harder. Um, Cause he was a late kind of uh, higher in the cycle. Yeah. So. No, that, that's true. I mean, obviously you get the, you get the portal window a little bit, like you get it to a certain extent. Um, when, when you're like, what is it like 30 days when the coaching staff changes, players can move. And that, that probably influenced Washington bringing some, transfers from Arizona was just that the transfers from Arizona had more I think I think it is 30 days from your coach leaving you get like a, a an exception to go in the portal and, and everything um but it's you know it's interesting the last thing I guess last word on this but um game day this weekend it's the first time Indiana has hosted the full you know sort of recognizable Saturday game day they're going to be out on the South Lawn of Memorial Stadium. I don't think the game time allowed really them to, to put it anywhere else, frankly. Um, I I would – I mean, part of me thinks it would be a distraction, but every time I've expected this team to get distracted, it hasn't. And that includes last week when it was Nebraska. It was a bye week. Big noon kickoff was in town. Ranking, yada, yada, yada. Um, do you think game day affects this in any way or – because the thing is, I, I, I'm sure it can happen the other way, too. Do you think game day winds up kind of intensifying the atmosphere around this game to such an extent that it makes it hard for uh, it makes it hard for a team like, you know, Washington to, to break through just the the sort of like armor of momentum that Indiana has right now? I think if it was a primetime game, it might have mattered more. I just don't think that there's time for the players to even kind of care, uh, especially on Saturday. Like they're going to be in the midst of game prep while the game, all the hoopla is going on and um, getting right on the field as game day is sort of all the actually the, you know, the known, the, 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 the picks, the, the, you know, Lee Corso with the, um, with his, uh, that's going to happen while they're on the field warming up. So, I mean, they're going to have to, I mean, they don't. They don't even have to turn it off or ignore it. They just won't be able. To, they won't even be able to watch it because they'll be busy. So I, I think um, when you have a whole day, maybe does that make sense to like think about it and kind of watch all the 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 pop and circumstance that that might have gotten into them, you know, their mindset. But I just think by the nature of it, that that kickoff being at noon sort of wipes that away a little bit. Yeah, I think that's. I think that's probably fair. I also just think like. 
I know big noon kickoff's not game day, but I just think like if, especially because Indiana did like spent the bye week doing all this media and, and, you know, the attention was coming and the interest. And I, just, I, I guess I just sort of think that if Indiana was going to get distracted, it would have gotten distracted by now. If you understand, like if, if something was going to break that, that focus, it would have happened. Um, I think, I think it's a fair point you make about the game time. Um, I don't know. It's, it's going to be interesting. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's funny. Like I, I've started for the first time, I think really to sense some stress from IU football fans. I know not like an enormous amount, but I think it's suddenly becoming real to people, you know, that, that Indiana is playing for more than just kind of, you know, respect and a winning season and, and maybe go win a bowl game or whatever that Indiana is 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 genuinely trying to uh trying to put together a playoff resume here at this point and i think you know we're, we're still i don't i don't think anybody should worry too much about the playoff until the first rankings come out in november uh in early november but you know i i i understand why people are maybe suddenly sort of like suddenly there's a peril attached to this season that nobody really expected and i think people are trying to figure out how to, how to navigate that and it's fascinating it hasn't been uh Hasn't been a, a, a big problem around here very often in the past. Um, we'll be back after the game. I, I've got a, another uh, fun Mind Your Banners coming up for later this week. Uh, probably That'll probably be out Thursday. Um, so stay tuned for that with a special guest. Uh, but, you know, no one's no one's more special than Mike Nyslick of the Bloomington Herald Times. Um, and I am Zach Osterman, far less special, but still very grateful for all of you for having listened this far, this has been Mind Your Banners for October 23rd, 2024. We will be back again soon. Thank you so much for listening.